Would you please um, just bring the house lights up a little bit more because I'm going to move around and this is the service we're using for YouTube and I don't want to just step out into darkness, you know? So I don't know how you how to bypass the presets, but if we can just turn those up all the way around there. Oh, wow. Good morning, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, in about... A minute, Aaron, you can just advance that slide to the next blank slide and you don't have to worry about following me today. But the rest of you, no such bargain. All right, so I really appreciated the scriptures that were read this morning, but they're not the scripture I'm going to preach on. I'm going to preach on my favorite verse of all time. Ready? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And the Greek word for obey means to wait on hand and foot. Never mind. Okay. All right. So, uh, at any rate... Um, one thing that I've never been accused of is looking like my dad. Many of you have heard stories about my dad because I'm fond of sharing them as I uh, get a chance to share messages with you. My dad had blonde hair and blue eyes. He was pretty fit from working on the farm every day from like three in the morning till midnight sometimes. And um, rumor has it that he was a great dancer but he had a nose that turned red every time the sun came out. I got the nose. Okay, so other than that, though, I never really thought I looked anything like my dad. About uh, 20 years, I guess, after my dad died and we moved away from our hometown, I um, got to sing at my cousin's wedding back in our hometown, and at the reception, a friend came up to me who'd been a hired hand on the farm. He was a couple years older than I was, and we became close because we did a lot of chores together. And um, he um, came to me after the reception of Brad and said, you know, Andrew, you look just like your dad. I said, <laughs> okay, you remember what my dad looked like? I looked nothing. He said, no, 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 no. When you sing, you look just like your dad. I just really loved your dad, and so I would make sure I was in church every time he sang. And when he sang, he tilted his head just so, and he held his jaw just so, and you looked just like him. I really treasured that moment when I was told for the first time in my life, really, that I looked like my dad. Because I always looked up to my dad, and I always feared my dad, and I loved, and I still love my dad. <clears throat> the scriptures that Christy read for us this morning, which really are the scriptures the sermon is based on, give us two dads that we can look like. The first one in the Gospel of John, the words of Jesus. Don't you love how he just took it to the house right there, man? He's like, these are the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, all of that. And he's like, you know, you, you, you know how important to them a pure bloodline was. You know, we are children of Abraham. Jesus is like, no, that's not who you're acting like. You're plotting to kill me. You have no room for my message, which is the truth. And you're acting just like your father, the devil. Baron took us back to Genesis 3 in worship today when he mentioned uh, the serpent and Adam and Eve. And of course, ever since that happened, uh, we have all been born into sin and we bear more, we inherit the characteristics of the devil. But wait, 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 wait. Aren't we all made in the image of God? Well, that's true. We all have a conscience, however weak some of ours may be. We all have an inclination somewhere to do good sometimes. And we all are going to live forever. And so in that way, the image of God that we are made in, in those ways, still is in us. But if you look around, sin is the order of the day. We have mass shootings. We have abuse of power. We have violence in our streets, even in the streets of Bakersfield. There's a song, never mind. And um, we have assault of many different kinds, just to name four problems that we see prevalent in the world today. 
But we have a Savior, and we have a different Father that we can look like. He is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is one with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ, his Son, whom he sent to be Savior of the world. He dwells in light. He's the author of truth, and he is good, and his love endures forever. As God's children, we look most like our Heavenly Father when we abide in love. That's my first of three main points today, okay? I'm going to repeat it again, and then you're going to repeat it, and I'm sure you're going to want to write this down. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it, then you're going to repeat it, then I'm sure you're going to want to write it down somewhere, right? Okay, so here we go. As God's children, we look most like our Heavenly Father when we abide in love. Let's say it. As God's children, we look most like our Heavenly Father when we abide in love. Now, as you write that down, I'll tell you a dad joke, okay? Kid comes to his dad and says, Dad, I'm thirsty. And dad says... Hi, Thirsty, I'm Dad. Exactly, very good. That happened to me a thousand times when I was a kid. You'd think I'd learn after the first couple times, right? Every time. Hi, Thirsty, I'm Dad. 1 John 4.13, we read, This is how we know that we abide in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. Now, I'm going to choose to use the word abide rather than live in. Different translations use live in or abide. But to me, the word abide is closer to what the Apostle John was getting at because the word abide seems to me to have a a feeling of duration and a feeling of direction that just the word live in just seems to be a little more passive. Abide in uh, gives me a feeling that This is my home. I'm staying there, come what may, and I'm present in it. This is my home. I'm staying there, come what may, and I'm present in it. Abiding in this love has a threefold foundation. The Holy Spirit, the testimony of the apostles, and a personal choice and confession. In 1 John 4.13, and by the way, feel free to have your Bible open to 1 John chapter 4. We're just going to march right through to verse 19, and you can hopefully tell that I'm not making this stuff up, hopefully, okay? So um, feel free to do that if you want. Also, if you want to follow along, along if you have the version on your phone, and you want to follow along on that, it's uh, events, First John Methodist Church should be right there, boom, my... Uh, fantastic long three-point outline for today is right on there, and as well as a couple other questions. All right, so abiding in love has a threefold foundation, the Holy Spirit, the testimony of the apostles, and a personal choice in confession. 1 John 4, 13, this is how we know that we abide in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. God gives us his spirit. Now, this is a two-way street. It's not just us deciding to abide in God and deciding that he's going to be my home, I'm going to stay there come what may, and I'm going to be present in God. It's not just that, but by his spirit, his spirit is in us. God says, I'm making my home in you. I'm going to stay in you come what may, and I'm going to be present in you. That's kind of like miracle stuff, guys. That's amazing. God is in you. The scriptures say that God has given us of his spirit. So we can be individual, uh, individually a child of God. But as children of God, God has given us of his spirit. That means that we share some of the same experiences of the Holy Spirit. And we get, when we get together, we can encourage each other with stories of how the Holy Spirit has been manifested in our lives, how he's reached through us to touch other people, and how he's challenging us to do even greater things for the sake of Jesus. Secondly, second part of this foundation of abiding in love is the testimony of the apostles given to us in the word of God to examine and receive 
1 John 4, 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son as Savior of the world. We're already talking in us's and we's, and the um, we in verse 14 is connected to the us in verse 13, but this also gets more specific as the Apostle John says, we have seen and testify. We are eyewitnesses of Jesus. We saw him walk among us. We saw his miracles. We heard his teaching. And so the apostolic teaching and Holy Spirit inspired instructions to the early church are given to us in the New Testament. They are given to us in the scripture for us not just to say, oh yeah, this is God's word, but for us to examine and for us to receive and put into practice in our own lives. And that is just as much a part of abiding in God as the Holy Spirit living within us. The third part of the foundation is a personal choice and confession about who Jesus is in your life. Verse 15, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Jesus is one being and one substance with the Father. He is God. One with the Holy Spirit and the Father. He was from eternity with God, took on flesh in order to dwell among us to redeem us and in time all of creation. When we acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God, we are agreeing that he is the Lord sent from the Father as Savior of the world. That's his title. That's his place. And he shares it and should share it with no other. So we see this foundation for abiding in love, right? The Holy Spirit, the Apostle's testimony, and personal choice and confession. Those three things are the foundation of abiding in love. All right, time for another dad joke. Oh, yeah, you're ready now, right? Okay, so scuba divers, all right? Scuba divers always dive backwards. Why don't they dive forwards? Because if they dive forwards, they'll be diving into the boat. Oh, gosh. Okay, but diving backwards really is a great example of faith and surrender. As that scuba diver falls backwards into the water, he knows he's hitting the ocean. As we fall backwards in trust and surrender to God, we know that we're in the ocean of God's grace and mercy And we find out every day, God is love. Turn to somebody near you and say, God is love. All right, look forward now. We're going to say it really loud. Ready? Here we go. God is love. I want you to whisper it. God is love. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is a great statement of truth. God is love. The Greek word is agape, which is a a word that talks about that intense, commitment-centered kind of love. But think about this statement. God is love. God is love. Now... I know that what I'm going to say is a little bit challenging, okay? It's kind of crazy talk in our culture right now at this very moment in time. Because we don't say God is love anymore. We say love is love. The scriptures, though, say that God is love. Now, notice what 1 John 4, 16 doesn't say. John, 1 John 4.16 does say, God is love. It does not say, love is God. Because true love is rooted in God, in his holiness and purity, 
in his grace and mercy. God is love. And because God is love, what are some other characteristics of love then, of God then, that love is? God is love. God is unchangeable. God is all-powerful. God is unstoppable. Huh? Isn't that amazing? And so when we say God is love, all of those things, just like holiness and purity and mercy and grace, unstoppable, unchangeable, all-powerful, that is love. And that is the love that we proclaim and the love that we are invited to abide in. An unstoppable, all-powerful, limitless love. A love that accepts you as you are, but is not content to have you stay there, but desires you to grow into all that God has for you to be. God is love. This abiding in love is how we look most like our dad. There are three things that help me focus on abiding in love. Those three things are not going to be a mystery to you. You've heard them all your life in church at least. Those three things to focus our attention on abiding in love are this. The words that you say and sing. The voices that you listen to and images that you see. And the things that you do with your hands and feet. Those three things help me at least focus on abiding in love. I just want to talk about the first thing, the words that you say and sing. That's why, brothers and sisters, I'm really passionate about worship and music. That's why we sing. It's great to say things. When we say things and we pray together like the Lord's Prayer, that's awesome. But when we sing, a new dimension kind of opens up in our spirits. We become more vulnerable and we unlock places in our hearts toward God in worship that we don't usually let loose. Now, some of you are sitting there, you're like, I cannot sing. I have never been able to sing. When I was seven years old in second grade, the music teacher had three groups. She had the Canaries, she had the Robins, and she had the Bluebirds. The Robins sang the melody, the Canaries sang the harmony, and the Bluebirds weren't allowed to sing at all. <laughs> and guess which group I was in? Yep, I was always in the Bluebirds. Oh yeah, got to just stand there and You don't have to sing like uh, Michael or Melissa or Baron in order to sing praises when you're in church. Now, if you want to be in a worship team, we have auditions, okay. <laughs> but the scripture doesn't say, you got to sing with precision and skill when you sing the praises of God. The scriptures say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's why we also give you some clapping options, you know? All right? But listen, do it. Don't just stand there and let the words run by you. Open your mouth and sing. You'll be amazed at the things that God does in you because you've just opened up your mouth because you're opening up your heart a little bit too. It's really, truly an amazing experience. Okay. I want to talk about one other really practical thing that I do that I've discovered to help me focus on God. And I know you're looking at the time. It's like, whew, it feels like he's only about halfway through. And you would be right. <laughs> but I'm going to try to land this plane as quickly as possible here. All right. Here it is. 
Meditation. I don't know how many of you have ever meditated or currently meditate in your life, but I've found it to be very powerful when I do it. Now, in Eastern meditation, they prescribe just emptying your mind of all things and just, you know, focusing on nothingness for a while. And that can be really effective if you, you know, for different problems or situations. But Christian meditation, after you've kind of emptied your mind, then you focus on a phrase in the scripture or a Bible-centered prayer. And so the Bible-centered prayer that I want to just meditate with you on today is called the Abba prayer. Abba is a word of intimacy for our Father. It's like Daddy in the New Testament. And the scriptures say that the Holy Spirit within us causes us to cry, Abba, Daddy, Father, I love you. I need you. I'm vulnerable to you. Now, some of you might be saying, whoa, 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 take a step back, Jack. Okay, I like to be a little bit detached from my religion. All right, thank you very much. Well, you go ahead and be detached for your religion. But if you're abiding in love, sooner or later, you're going to feel attachment. Okay, so I'm just preparing you, okay? All right, so everybody, for a moment, the preacher is going to give you permission to close your eyes. Go ahead, close your eyes for a moment. All right. Take a deep breath and just gently blow it out. Now we're going to take a deep breath and just say, Abba, I belong to you. Ready? Abba, I belong to you. Let's do that again. Ready? Take a deep breath. Abba, I belong to you. You can make that longer if you wish. Take a deep breath and just say, Abba. And another deep breath, say, I belong. Another deep breath, say, to you. What meditation does in my life is it helps me focus on who God is. Abba. And who I am. And who I am to God. I belong. Not on the outside. I belong. You can do that when you're stressed. You can do that first thing in the morning. You can do that at night. Anytime that person comes to you that just pushes all your buttons, Abba, I belong to you. Okay, open your eyes at least for a minute so I know that you're still with me for the ending of the landing of this plane, all right? So we talked about abiding in love. We talked about God is love. And the final verses of this passage talk about being perfected in love. And the fact that the scriptures point out that the one who fears is not perfected in love. That's in 17, 18, and 19. If you're like, huh, what's he talking about? Okay, so I have a question. We were just in the book of Proverbs a few months ago. And the book of Proverbs says over and over again that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, how does that jive with this, huh? Well, I'll give you an illustration. Um, I asked on Facebook this week uh, what your relationship was like with your dad when you're a child, when you're a teenager, when you're an adult. One to three words. And a lot of my friends answered, and it it was great. Some of you answered and it was wonderful. Some people took more like one to three paragraphs instead of one to three words, but it was all good. It was really good. It was wonderful to read all those things, and if you're my friend on Facebook, you can still go. It's like the first five entries probably, or you know, read through the comments and stuff. It's really cool. If you're not my friend on Facebook, as I said before, I'm not that choosy. Just put in a friend request, uh, and uh, uh, I'll be glad to add you, but at any rate, just get not that choosy. You know, let that sink in. It's what a jerk. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway. So, um, some positive things about Dad. He was loving. He was supportive, and he was present. Men, are we present? Boy, that's something that God is really dealing with me about. Oof. And I am so imperfect at that. So know that anything that I say about being present, I'm speaking into a mirror, okay? But we live in a world of distractions, especially for, for us men. It's a world of distractions. It's from work. 
It's uh, the news. It's uh, social media interaction with buds and, and friends and keeping up with our favorite games, whether they be sports or whether they're kind of video games or something. And they all seem to be centered and wrapped up in this. Did you know you can also make phone calls on this? I, I don't know. I just, it's just something funny. Um, but it used to be the newspaper. You know, sometimes it's ball games. you know. There's always something for us to get distracted in, men. And I know what it's like, okay? Because I fight that too. Because men, it's kind of fun to just be check out. You know, it's just kind of fun to check out and take a deep breath and do. Well, you can check out and you can take a deep breath, but but you got to get back in the game quick, all right? Because uh, my fear is that we're being we we are the generation that's raising a generation that are going to be raised by loving, well-meaning parents who are in the room but absent. And men, we really need to step up and be present and work on that in our lives. Okay. That's another sermon within the sermon, sorry. Um, but that's something that God's really been dealing with me about. Some negative comments about fathers. He was strict, stern, and scary. Three words, be a man. More like uh, five or six words, seven. I'm going to prepare you for your life. The the brother who said that also said as during adulthood that he discovered love and relationship with his father when he was in his 20s. So whenever I did something wrong when I was a little kid, <laughs> I had a reason to be afraid. My father gave me a good reason to be afraid. Whenever I disobeyed, told a lie, talked back to my mother, whatever it was, I could count on punishment. The punishment always came in one form. Well, uh, the prelude to it was, why are you being punished? And I had to say why I was being punished, and I always knew. It was never a mystery, okay? And then the Board of Education was applied to the seat of knowledge. And to coin a Wesley phrase, my rear end was strangely warm, okay? Uh, and it happened every time. And it got to the point where every time I was about to do something wrong, I'd think about that consequence. And about half the time, it caused me to stop. And then it was maybe two-thirds of the time. It was never all the time. <laughs> but it made me stop. And then I also noticed that my relationship with my dad began to change. He was not always the lawgiver and enforcer. He became more of my friend, too. And I've seen that in several testimonies written on Facebook, that when they became adults, they realized that their dad really did love them. And they became friends with their dad. And it was a really good and positive thing in their lives. Now, fear is not an illegitimate motivator. It's not. Not illegitimate. There are many people who are Christians today because they were afraid of the fires of hell. And that's why they became a Christian. So? It's a reality. But if that's where you stay in your Christian life, if I'm just a Christian because I'm afraid of the fires of hell and I'm afraid that God's going to get me if I'm not on his side, then I'm not truly abiding in love. I'm not knowing God in all of his fullness, in all of his love. I'm not abiding in him to the point where I move from a behavioral basis to a relational basis with God. And I move from a fear-driven relationship to a love-driven relationship. So as the worship team comes back up, we're just going to summarize really, really fast as God's children, I look most like my dad when I abide in love. I'm abiding. It's my home. I'm staying come what may. And I'm present.